song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, 
just a name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you See holy Holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes and wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes and wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me Build my life. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken.
Hey everybody, welcome to Freedom Hope Online. You are here, my family, because you believe that through Christ, we can experience freedom and hope for the future. And our goal is to see that happen around you through Christ's blood. And today is no different, but it is special. To quote C.S. Lewis, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, you too? I thought I was the only one. Our guest has a mission to make Christ known in his neighborhood, in his city. The passion he has to reach those willing to listen is truly an amazing thing. We met at his church plan. We had coffee afterwards and discovered how much we have in common. And he and I became brothers in arms as we would begin church planting in neighboring places. He is an amazing dude. He's a kind, loving, thoughtful man who cares so much about people. And I know that you're going to be truly blessed by him. He's currently the founder and lead pastor of South Chicago Community Church right here in Chicago. Has served the Lord in the city for over three years. He and his wife, Marcy, and their three ch children, Matthew, Caleb, and Gwen, serve the community well. He is a leader. He is a teacher. He's an evangelist. He's a great preacher and teacher of the Word of God. My friend, Brian Cole. Good morning, Freedom Hope Church. I am excited to be with you guys this morning. I love you guys so much. We are two like-minded churches uh, ministering here on the north side of Chicago. We are part of the SEN Network together. Uh, we have a lot of things in common, so I'm really excited that Pastor Dom asked me to speak for you guys in your New Mercies series today. Uh, so we are going to go through a lot of scripture, but I'm not going to go through every single little bit of the text because we would be here for three hours if that was the case. Uh, so I'm going to focus text-wise a lot on 1 Samuel 17. So if you want to go ahead and jump there, you can, but I'm going to story I'm going to tell a little bit about 1 Samuel 9, all of 9, and a little bit of 10 because what I want to do is I want to kind of compare two characters in the Bible, King Saul and King David. And these are two very not alike people at all. Saul Big tall Saul, that's what we'll call him. Uh, Israel wanted a king. They had all of these judges, and they just kind of get tired of it. They want a king just like everybody else. So Saul kind of looks the part. He looks like a king. He's the biggest. He's the strongest. He's the most handsome. So obviously, he's the one who's probably going to become king. There is one little thing, though. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the smallest tribe in Israel. So from that standpoint, he may not make king, but uh, he does end up eventually being king, but he does it in a lot different way. So if we are going through 1 Samuel 9, we see that Saul is looking for his father's donkeys, okay? He lost some donkeys. And, you know, he's kind of the kind of guy that's going to kind of phone it in. Like, he, he already knows he needs to go look for these donkeys, but he's not really putting a whole lot of effort into it. And his dad kind of knows that, so he says, hey, take my servant with you and go and find these donkeys. So they go into town, they go and try and find the donkeys, and Saul right away is kind of ready to go back home and go to bed. And he's just like, you know what? We can't find the donkeys. My dad's getting worried. We need to just go back home. Luckily, his servant is with him. This teaches us a little bit about God and also a little bit about the church and our need for other people in our lives. We all need accountability. Good accountability is part of being obedient, right? Because Saul had to be obedient to go and listen to his dad and go find these donkeys, right? But without accountability, this wouldn't have happened. Let me go ahead and explain why. Now I said, as Saul was looking for his donkeys, or his dad's donkeys, not his donkeys, he's ready to kind of go home and go to bed. But his servant says, wait a second, what if we went ahead and talked to the man of God in the town? right? He heard there was a seer, a guy who talks to God, who knows God, and maybe we could talk to him and he could tell us where the donkeys are. Right away, Saul starts making excuses. We don't have enough money. We don't have anything we can give the guy. And the servant says, I have some silver. So we went ahead and took care of that. Don't worry about it, Saul. So they go and they find the guy 
and something amazing happens. This guy, who is Samuel, of course, who's writing the book, who finds Saul, who finds David, who finds all sorts of kings, right? That's how God used Samuel. Samuel finds Saul. And Saul fits the description of what he's looking for when God is telling him who the next king is going to be, right? Now, if Saul would have just went home and went to bed, he never would have met Samuel. He may have never became king. So he needed that person. He needed that accountability partner to help him. Otherwise, he would have missed out on the blessing that God wanted to give him, right? So Saul ends up finding the donkeys because Samuel says, don't worry about the donkeys. They've already been found. When Samuel, or when Saul, rather, when Saul goes back to his father, of course, the donkeys have already made it home safely. And his dad is actually worried about him because the donkeys made it home and Saul did not. So we see Saul end up being anointed as king in 1 Samuel chapter 10. We see that Saul is anointed as king. Now, Saul puts things off, right? He does. He makes excuses. He procrastinated, right? He didn't go right away. He makes excuses. He didn't fully rely upon God. But with help, he was able to stay on task. We need accountability, right? That's why we have the church. That's why we have the fellowship of the church with us, right? To spur us on as we follow Jesus. We need accountability. Because something we have to do as we are following Christ is we are supposed to be more like Christ as we follow Christ, right? Now, we are justified in Christ, right? Justification means that because Christ died for us on the cross, we are justified in our faith that we believe that happened, right? And that we are saved because He saved us from all of our sin as He died upon the cross, as He rose on the third day in glory. And now we go through a new process called sanctification. Sanctification is the process by how we become more and more like Christ. But when we don't do our spiritual disciplines, when we don't read our Bible, when we don't pray for our neighbors, when we don't share the gospel, when we don't take that big leap of faith and actually become a Christian, if we're kind of kicking the tires on Christianity right now, we lose what God wants to give us, right? Because we're not being obedient. We're procrastinating. We're putting things off. That's what Saul did. He procrastinated. He made excuses. And because of that, God wasn't able to give him a lot of the things that he wanted to give him. It was that accountability partner that he had that allowed him to be able to do that. But as Saul continues as king, he starts to lose that accountability and he starts to lose even more that reliance upon God, right? So when we put things off, it hurts our process of being sanctified. That is why it is so important if God is, is wanting us to do something, if we are leading or, or being led by the Holy Spirit, that we listen, right? That we are obedient, not later, but right then. Now, I fall into the trap myself all the time. I, I you know, do really good on my Bible reading throughout the week, and then maybe I miss Saturday because I have something going on. Now, I can pick it back up and I can get back on Sunday, right? But if I let it go way too many days, then I can miss out on what God might be trying to teach me, right? Maybe I need that verse as I'm going throughout my day. Or maybe praying. Maybe I'm praying for my neighbor every day, but I forget that one day, and then that's the day that I really need to be praying for my neighbor. It's important that we do those things. If we don't uh, be obedient or if we procrastinate, we can really miss out on what God wants to do in our lives. It can hurt our process of being sanctified. It can push us back from becoming a more mature Christ follower, right? But when we rely on God, 
obedience to follow becomes a little easier. Now, I'm not saying that it becomes a piece of cake, but it becomes a little easier. It's all about our attitude. It's all about how we do things. Now, there was another king, and his name was David. Now, we're going to focus a little more on David. We're actually going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to be reading starting at verse 12. But we're going to learn about King David. Now, he wasn't king yet. He was actually just a little boy. He was actually a shepherd at this point. He was not a king at all. But he was a shepherd who relied upon God. He was a shepherd who was obedient to God. And he was a shepherd who believed God was as powerful as he needed him to be, right? You see, he was a shepherd and he would actually have the problem of bears and lions trying to get his sheep. But because he believed that God would protect him, he would just go after them and basically take the livestock out of their mouths. Like, he was that kind of person. He was that obedient and that reliant upon God. That's more the person we want to be. We want to be more like David than we are Saul. Now, you're not David and you're not Saul, but God gives us an idea of who he is through Scripture and we can see these things, right? Now, David is in a very weird predicament because what he is doing is there's this battle between the Philistine and the Israelites and his brothers are actually at this battle. And there's this big guy we see in the first few verses, the first 11 verses in 1 Samuel 17, and his name is Goliath. And you have this valley, right? This valley of Allah, and you have the Israelites on one side, and you have the Philistines on the other side. And there's this big guy named Goliath. And he comes out every day, and he taunts the Israelites. Like, you think you're so bad? Well, I'm going to take you guys down. And it scares the Israelites to death. It scares Saul to death, right? Saul, we just talked about how he procrastinated. He could have took care of this issue of Goliath, but he waited. He forgot who was in control. He forgot that God was the one that was in control. David knew that God was in control. He believed that God could fight off wild animals for him. So if God could do that, he can definitely take down this guy because David knew what it meant to follow after God. As I said, when we rely on God, obedience to follow after Christ becomes easier. Again, it's not a cakewalk but it becomes easier. Let's look at verse 12. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 12. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shema. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. So Goliath would come out and taunt the Israelites morning and evening. And Jesse said to David his son, take for your brothers an ephrah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also, take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. <clears throat> Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines, which we saw in the first ten verses that I kind of gave you a summary of. And David rose early in the morning 
and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Now something very important that we need to see in the character of David right here. He's different than Saul, right? He went early in the morning. I emphasize that as I was reading. He went early in the morning. He went right away, right? He didn't waste any time. He went as soon as his dad told him. Verse 21, And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran. He ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. Now, was David scared? Was David shaking, worried about what was going to happen to him? He was not. Verse 24, All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. You see, David didn't understand what the big deal about this guy was. David saw God do amazing things for him. God knew, or David knew that God was bigger than this giant warrior. David was different than Saul. He didn't waste any time. He didn't look at the situation and say, how am I going to fix this? He looked at the situation and said, oh, God's bigger than this guy, and He's going to deliver this guy over to us. David was obedient. He was quick to follow God. He called out others in the camp for not having the faith that he had in God. David knew who he was and who God was and still is. David knew that God would be victorious. David knew he wouldn't be victorious. David knew he wasn't the one that was going to defeat the Philistine. But he knew God would. And he would be obedient to whatever God asked. Let's look at verse 33. Now David is, is ready to take on this guy. And he goes to Saul. And Saul's kind of like, Really, man? You? You? You're going to take this guy down? I'm afraid of this guy. I'm big, tall Saul. Look at my armor over there. You're going to take this guy down? Verse 33, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. So not only are you small, he's also a warrior and has been a warrior for much longer than you. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be just like one of them, for he has defiled the armies of the living God. Wow. David is not confident in himself. David is confident in God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. He probably was kind of like, Okay, buddy. Go for it. 
Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail because Saul knew he needed some sort of armor or some sort of thing to protect him, right? Hey, you're going to try it. You're going to need this. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I can't go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. He put them off. You see, if we looked at that situation, would we be like, well, can you make some armor in my size? Like, do you have anything? Like, I'm not going to go out there by myself. David took all of the armor off and said, you know what? I don't need any of it. I've got a God who's bigger than all of those things, and I'm going to rely on him. Verse 40 tells us what he did. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Wow. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Wow. Wow. This Philistine that came day and night and taunted the Israelite soldiers, some of their best soldiers, and King Saul, and this small shepherd boy named David, not only comes out, but he prophetically tells Goliath what's going to happen to him. Verse 48. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle to meet the Philistine, or towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut off his head. When the Philistine saw that the champion was dead, or that their champion was dead, they fled. Saul put things off. He missed what God wanted to do in this situation. If he would have just continued going on when he first became king, he never would have became king. But we see that he still is procrastinating. He still is putting things off. We cannot put things off because when we put things off, we miss the vision that God wants to give us. When we do the same thing that Saul did, we miss things. Again, I said I've been there, right? I've missed my Bible reading plan. I've missed my prayer for the morning. I've got busy and I've put things off. But without that help, without that accountability, putting things off can become completely forgetting to do those things. 
And that can hurt my walk with Christ, and that is not okay, right? If we are to be sanctified, to be more like Christ, we have to not put things off. David did not put things off. David relied upon God. When David saw the Philistine, he didn't wait. He didn't strategize. He went right after Goliath because he knew that God would deliver him. Saul missed out. Not just on being able to glorify God, but eventually being king because David would end up taking over the kingship. Because he didn't procrastinate. He didn't rely on himself. He relied on God always. He didn't make excuses, and he fessed up when he was wrong. So here's some takeaways. Number one, we need the accountability of others to stay on task for Christ, right? We saw this in the story of Saul, right? If he would not have had the servant with him, who knows what would have happened to Saul. But he had the servant with him. He had that accountability person. David messes up royally pretty far into his kingship. And he has a prophet that keeps him accountable and allows him to stay a man after God's own heart. He needed that accountability. We need that accountability. That's why we need our, our brothers and sisters in our church so that we can be held accountable, so that we can become more like Christ. God doesn't create us to be alone. He creates us to be in community. So we need that accountability partner. Number two, when we put things off, it hurts our process of being sanctified. That doesn't mean that we, we lose our faith in Christ or anything like that, but it, we, we lose the blessing that God wants to give us. Or maybe if you're kicking the tires on Christianity right now, and maybe this is the first time that you've heard any of this stuff, and you want to follow after Christ, but you just can't take that extra step. Don't procrastinate. Do it today. Don't look for a reason to get out of it. Start following Him today. And if you are a follower of Christ, don't let anything stop you from being a passionate follower of Christ. There are people who are lost and who are dying who need to hear the gospel, the good news that Jesus saved them. Don't not be obedient. Follow after Christ. Number three takeaway, when we rely on God, obedience to follow after Him becomes easier. Right? If we rely on ourselves, if we try to have everything be perfect, we just can't do it. Right? Saying we can do this or that later, it does nothing to further our faith. When God calls us to be obedient, it requires us to trust Him. But the mercy that we get is that we don't have to do everything perfectly and that we will mess up. We will get to that point where we're probably going to put something off. But we have in this way of being sanctified and being more like Christ. We have to look at the obedience that Jesus had. We have to look at how he prayed. Now he's more than just a step of how we're supposed to be obedient. He saved us, right? He's something much greater than that. But when we don't do everything perfectly, we can still come back. Saul never did. We see later in his life, he actually starts to look at other gods and other magical forces to try to get favor. David didn't do that. The thing is, we can't fix it. There's only one who can, and that's Jesus. Because no matter how we try to please God, we can't. When we follow as disciples of Christ, we can't do it alone. We have to have each other. We need community. That's why we need each other. To remind ourselves of the one who can help us and to keep our focus on him always. Since we can't be perfect, we need each other. But we can't save ourselves. We need something more than just each other. We need a relationship with Christ. That's why Jesus came. 
Not just to show us what obedience really was, but to be that obedience for us. To save us from doing it all on our own and allowing Him to give us the power to perfect our faith through Him, not through ourselves. In Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do this, but only with Him. And we're still going to mess up because we're not perfect. But we can be more like Him if we rely upon His power and not the power of ourselves. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you are empowered to be obedient. In Christ, you can give Him the glory as you are obedient to Him. Remember, we reflect the glory of God. That's why we look at these scriptures. It's not just to, to give us a life plan of, of how to not procrastinate. It's to show us what can happen to us to see the character of God and how He saves us from this, right? Through Christ... We can give Him glory as we are obedient to Him. Even David knew this. We see as David writes in the Psalms, he knew about the Messiah before he came upon the scene. He knew he needed something to save him that was not of himself. Saul didn't know that. He didn't seek that out. He died not knowing that. That's what made David a better leader. That is what makes us a better follower of Christ. That we rely on Him and not ourselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this church, God. Thank you for Freedom Hope. Thank you for Dom and Tiffany. Thank you for everyone in this church and everything you're doing in their lives and in the lives of this church. God, I pray that you would give them maximum impact for the gospel. God, I pray you would get the glory. God, I pray that, that you would bring people to faith through this church and to a deeper relationship with you through this church. God, I pray you would protect this church. Let them make an impact in Albany Park and beyond in the city of Chicago. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, you search me How you know me You perceive my every thought All my wandering, still you love me, King of glory. You pursue my anxious heart. Even when I'm not your faithful, even when I doubt your truth, holds, even when I'm lost, you won't let me go. My heart is dry, your grace flows No matter where I run, I'm not far from home Yeah, I may be weak, but you're able Even when I'm not, you're faithful Even when I'm not, you're faithful Lord, you search me How you know me Receive my every thought from afar And all my wandering Still you love me King of glory You pursue my anxious heart Even when I'm not your faithful Even when I doubt your truth even when I'm lost, you won't let me go When my heart is dry, your grace flows No matter where I run, I'm not far from home Yeah, I may be weak, but you're able Even when I'm not, you're faithful Where can I 
I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your face? Where can I flee from your presence? Where could I go? Where could I go? If I rise through the heavens, you're with me. If I fall to the depths of the sea, even there's your hand that will lead me. Wherever I go, wherever I go, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your face? Where can I flee from your presence? Where would I go? Where would I go? If I rise through the heavens, you're with me. If I fall to the depths of the sea, even there it's your hand that will lead me. Wherever I go, wherever I go. Even though I'm not your faithful, even when I doubt your truth holds, I'm lost, you won't let me go When my heart is dry, your grace flows No matter where I run, I'm not far from home Yeah, I'm in the weak, but you're able Even when I'm not, you're faithful